Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome again to Celebrating Act Two. We are with John Mariani, uh, the Celebrating Act Two food and travel editor and a man who created the virtual gourmet art. Tell me about uh, your favorite food myths. Well, I have, there are a bunch of seafood myths because for me, if I see food, I'll eat it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, be, is that good enough grown to start with? But, but there are, yeah, I think so, yeah. there are a bunch of them. And um, th probably one of my favorite is uh, Dover Soul. Is that from Dover? Well, it would seem to be by the name Dover Soul, kind of like London Broil, which has nothing to do with London. But no, Dover Soul is a misnomer. Dover Soul in the market is going to be very, very expensive because it's really fat, a lot of good fat, rich flavor to it. But the reason it's called Dover is it's the exact same species as other sole from that part of the world, the North Sea and so forth, Solea, Solea in, in Latin. I, I, that's why I'm wearing my pro, professorial glasses, so I could say that in Latin. And it's the same exact species, <laughs> but it's just that traditionally, hundreds of years ago, the very best sole came into the big seafood market at Dover in England. So that's why it's called Dover sole. It's the exact same fish, it's just a, a finer quality, let us say, because it's fattier. And if it's not, if they sell you Dover sole on a plate, it's just a little teeny weeny little filet of lemon sole or something. Um, don't pay seventy-five dollars for it, please. Okay. Oh, uh, you can trust me. I'm not paying seventy-five bucks for fish. Uh, but you know that brings us uh, another. Uh, I don't know what you call it—a a rule to live by regarding seafood, and that is, frozen fish is not as good. It's not as tasty. The texture isn't as good as fresh fish and that i don't know it seems true doesn't it well it is true in the best of all possible worlds where you either just caught it yourself out of some wonderful river in idaho and put it into your creel so good to stick things in your creel once in a while i always say uh, <laughs> or you bought it let's say from the pikes market uh, up there in uh, seattle where um, a lot of that stuff is coming flapping into the into the seafood market uh, that morning um but if those trawlers have been out for weeks as most japanese trawlers are um those fish are flash frozen and that freezes them down to like i don't know 150 degrees so not only does it kill off the bacteria in the fish if there had been any but it's also uh, allowing the, the all the insides and the muscles and everything else the fluid in the fish to be rock solid but if you take a fish and you throw it into a regular freezer it takes a long time for that thing to become frozen and that's where the musculature and everything starts to break down when you defreeze it or keep it in the freezer for too long but flash freezing which you can't do at home is the way to go so very uh, interesting so i um I was always brought up uh, believing that uh, smoked fish, uh, the more expensive it was, the better it was. Just it had to be. And uh, then we got Nova and we got Belly and we got this and we got that. But the, the good stuff was always more expensive. Is that true? It is absolutely positively true, but there's no really good reason why it needs to be, because if you ever gone to a factory, uh, in, whether it's in Scotland or Norway or anywhere else, and see what the process is to smoke a fish, here's what they do. Take fish, put fish into hot box with smoke, either warm smoke or cold smoke. Let it hang, take out of box, put into package, sell at an outrageous price and <laughs> that's all it. you can do it and you can go right to uh williams sonoma or wherever and buy a little smoke box which you can you know like one foot by one foot and um you could put it in there and you could smoke it in there you could smoke it uh in one of those boxes with some um 
um, not even chips, um, oak chips or, or whatever, and um, get the, the get the heat going through, and uh, we'll get a lot of smoke. And you, as a matter of fact, can determine just how smoky you want. You want a light smoke? You want a, a real hefty smoke, depending on how you like it. Um, so no, it should not cost what it does because the process itself is is, is highly un complex. Okay. Not complex. I'm going to John, put my we're... glasses on again now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that professor. helps. Thank <laughs> you, Professor John. <laughs> Makes your answers much better. <laughs> uh, John, you, you know, we're on the West Coast uh, and uh, originally from uh, New York myself. So out here, we get rock lobsters, mm -hmm. but they're still on the menu, fresh, quote, fresh flown in live Maine lobster. And I, you know, I guess I'm not enough of a gourmand to know the difference, and I don't have lobster that often to be able to compare them. But I think the myth is that, the, and maybe it's true, you tell me, that Maine lobster is the best lobster. Is that true? Uh, yes and no. Uh, a lobster from Maine, which is, I have my glasses on, Homaris Americanus, okay, um, is <laughs> the best lobster in the world. But the lobs, the same lobster Americanus that swims in Maine waters also swims in Newfoundland waters and all the way down to the Carolinas. So a so-called Maine lobster that is plucked out of the water of uh, the Chesapeake Bay is uh, the exact same lobster. Um, Maine, the reason they, it's kind of like the Dover Sole thing. Maine has colder waters. The colder the water, the more fat the beast has to build up. The more fat, the more flavor. And it's pretty much simple as that. As a matter of fact, if you buy a lobster uh, in, a, in a seafood market or you get one in a restaurant and they crack it open and you see that the flesh in the claw is kind of pulled away from the claw itself rather than be tied up against it, that means that that lobster has been eating its own fat for a while. It's been around for a while. So uh, that's what you, what you want to see that thing bulked up with um, well, fat flesh. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, another thing that uh, that happens out here in, uh, on the West Coast is salmon. Uh, they, salmon yeah. they don't have Brooklyn salmon, which I guess would be kind of inexpensive, but they have uh, fresh salmon, not fresh salmon, Pacific Northwest salmon, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, what are the best salmons? Yeah, well, the farm raised salmon. That's the big well, question. Is it? Yeah. Should I buy oh, farm raised? Thank you, Farmer John. Yeah. Well, the, 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 Mr. The, Salmon guy. The answer to Art's question is that the Pacific Northwest does produce some of the finest fresh salmon available if you can find it. Okay. And and they have seasons. Sometimes the season is only a couple of weeks. Copper salmon and uh, the king salmon and so forth. But ninety nine percent of the of the salmon that you're going to eat is in fact farm raised on, God knows what pellets i've been i've been to norway and seen fish farms salmon farms you see all these what look like remarkably healthy little beasts uh, uh, swimming around eating pellets the equivalent of, of dry dog food or dry cat food that's what you are consuming a wild salmon consumes what nature intended them to consume and which they uh eat in the waters and the various rivers um so while there's great uh, Pacific salmon is equally great wild Atlantic salmon and certainly out of uh, uh, Scotland and other places so um, to eat and you know, it's more expensive not outrageously more expensive but it's more difficult to find but uh, it's so much more tasty than uh, the pellet raised stuff Ooh, pellets that's what my daughter f feeds the horses exactly so. I don't want that in my salmon. You, and you, uh, you don't eat your horses either, right? That's probably no, the that's reason why. <laughs> if somebody wants to eat them, we send them to France and they eat them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so last question for you, John, is caviar. Now, I've, I'm not a big caviar uh, consumer, but I've had all kinds of caviar that, uh, you know, I've, I've I'd never buy it out of the can, but I've had it at big part. And I've had some caviar that would make your eyes roll to the back of your head the fabulous flavor and i've had some caviar that didn't even taste like good fish eggs mm -hmm. and today you see russian caviar mm -hmm. uh, all over the place 
as if it's going to be the best caviar. And we can't possibly have Russian caviar from the Caspian Sea as readily available as it seems to be. What's what's in that stuff? Uh, It's Russian style. Meaning, okay, to go back, uh, put put on my glasses again. Okay, the sturgeon is the fish that is used to produce caviar, which is in in Russian ikra, okay? And the Caspian Sea, which is bordered by both Russia and um, Iran, uh, is where you get the best uh, beluga, sevruga, etc. Uh, uh, caviar and always have. Because it was so overly fished out, in 2005, they banned the fishing till these, till these animals could respond um, in numbers. During that time, caviar has been coming from other sources, or what is called caviar. It's really fish eggs. Uh, you have chupique, out of New Orleans, out of, out of the Gulf of Mexico, you have um, salmon roe, which is red, um, which has always been around, and you have a lot of stuff coming out of China, um, which I would hasten to say is not going to be as uh, certainly not as authentic as Caspian. But besides that, the way food is handled in caviar in China, uh, Thailand, I tend not to eat it. What you will see on those cans of Chinese caviar. Um, I think one is called Kavlar or Kavar. Kavlar is supposed to sound like caviar. And it'll even say Russian style, meaning it's taken from the same species of of sturgeon, but it's not coming out of the Caspian Sea. So it's it's Russian. So it's it's like, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, buttered popcorn. It's not really butter. It's fake butter. Uh, or uh, American cheese is not even American cheese. If you go down, read the fine print made from American cheese food products or Velveeta, which I don't know. I think that's made from the same pellets of salmon meat. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, but it's it's um, so it is a really being sold at a very high price. Some of this this uh, uh, Chinese caviar is going for like 200, 200 bucks a, a tin, and um, yeah. it's not. And it, see what they do. All caviar has to be salted, and when you see the term malasol, malasol caviar, all that means is a little salt was added, a little salt. Um, defects in caviar can be covered up by putting more salt. Uh, so you taste the salt, which is always savory and makes you salivate, and you taste the fish eggs itself, but it does not have the delicacy or refinement of the Russian. Iranian stuff, which are not likely to be back in the market for a long time. Ah, that's too bad. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. That's been great information, and uh, we will find more of this, I'm sure, on the virtual gourmet at johnmariani.com. You will. And, 52 weeks a year, free of charge. And not only that, but you have archives. So while we're hunkered in, socially distant, quarantined, or whatever you're your uh, word de jour is for stay at home, you can go and look in the archives and yep. see dozens and dozens and dozens of articles. All ten, make, years, ten years are archived. And salivating so that when we are finally released out into the world again, uh, we will be able to go and uh, buy the foods that John is talking about and uh, travel to the places hopefully soon that he's traveled and enjoy uh, the local cuisine. So to to everybody, thank you, John Mariani, uh, my partner, John, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you uh, during the next episode of Celebrating Act Two. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, Subscribe to us on YouTube and tell your friends. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.